Welcome to episode three of Animoca Brands. I'm Rich Robinson, EIR at Animoca Brands. Today, I'm talking with Vishal Gondal, serial entrepreneur and founder and CEO of Goki, which is bringing healthcare to the masses using Web3 technology. Let's go. Uh, listeners out there, uh, please uh, grab your mug o Joe and uh, fasten your seatbelts and put your tray tables in the upright position. One of my favorite entrepreneurs on the planet uh, is going to uh, give us some updates and drop some wisdom. Nice to see you, my friend. Nice seeing you, Rich. Always a pleasure talking to you and especially on this podcast. I'm really excited. Fantastic. Yeah, we were uh, looking at the 400 strong portfolio of uh, Animoca Brands and we had a little bit of a vote who we were going to have in the inaugural episodes and your name came up again and again and again, unsurprisingly so. Your hero's journey uh, is uh, pretty fantastic, and the quest that you are on right now uh, is pretty terrific. So, what, what do you uh, what do you have cooking uh, right now these days with uh, with Goki? I think uh, I'm personally very very excited uh, at the time at which we are. COVID is now at its tail end, and the world is opening up. But this is a different world we are living in. It's a world where everybody has realized that health is the ultimate wealth. There were billionaires and millionaires, and then there were poor people. But all of them uh, had to die, not because of anything which was communicable, but a virus came. And because of their poor immune systems, they had to face mortality. So I think the future of health is going to become personalized data-driven and preventative. And I think that is really the best cross-section to build on a Web3 platform. So I think personally, with what we are doing at Goki and the future of Web3 and Metaverse and everything which Animoca and all its companies are trying to build, I, I personally believe that health is going to be a very, very important use case. And at Goki, uh, we are really <coughs> pioneering this effort. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So give us a, a view out there in podcast land, what it looks like right now uh, to be a user of Goki and what the experience is. So I, I think before I get into the Goki system, I want to kind of talk to you about what is the problem. I think health... Great, please. So healthcare... Uh, is a very, very fragmented space. Uh, you know, the, the healthcare system is broken because it is not healthcare, it is sick care. It is designed not to prevent any illness, but to kind of treat when somebody is having a problem. So it is a very reactive system. The second thing is, in the existing healthcare system, incentives are not aligned. Uh, the incentives of pharmaceutical companies, hospitals, doctors, and what is good for the consumer may be not correct, which is why there is so much mistrust in the healthcare system worldwide. And we know examples of, uh, you know, what is, what is happening in the U.S. Uh, and thirdly, what happened is with COVID, more and more people started using medical devices or wearables to track their health. So consumers suddenly now have their own step data, their heart rate, their oxygen levels, their blood pressure, their glucose data. So a normal consumer who would normally never ever want to track these parameters unless they are in a hospital or in a doctor setting, everybody is doing it. So that opens a new opportunity to use this data and help people modify their behavior. And that's where Goki comes in. So what I believe is, with my own experience, so you know, when I was running uh, India's biggest gaming company, uh, I ended up weighing almost 120 kgs. You must have seen me in one of those 120 kg avatar. In school, I was a national volleyball player. So I figured out that, hey, what can I do to become healthy? And that's when I started using wearables and I used apps but nothing worked. What worked is when I was working with a coach who was guiding me and giving me personalized advice on WhatsApp. 
And using that system, I was able to now, I know I've been running marathons, I've been doing ultra marathons, I've been trekking to Everest Base Camp. So what I realized was health is not a challenge of data or access. Most healthcare companies will tell you, hey, we will connect you to the best doctor or we will give you the best medicine or we will give you the best formula or pill. But that is not the problem in health. The problem is most people know they should not be smoking or drinking excessively or eating junk food, but they still do it because 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 they lack the motivation and that is what Goki is trying to solve. So Goki is essentially a system to, to motivate you, to reward you, to engage you so that you continue to follow your habits, which are going to compound and make long-term change. So the, so the way Goki works, and now we have almost a million users on the, on the platform, wherein our users are, are using Goki app, they connect variables to it, they share their data, what they're eating, their food habits, and then they work with a coach who would guide them based on their data, what are the tweaks they need to do. And this behavior change leads to impact, and that impact can be measured in real value. So we have medical information connected into the Goki app. So if you're diabetic, you could track your HbA1c levels. If you have a problem with uh, with cholesterol, you could track your LDL and HDL. Or if you have a problem with weight, you can track your weight. So what we said is that how can we make this entire experience like a game? And believe me, this is 2014 and 15. So this is before Web3 or anything else came up. We actually created a system where we created Goki Cash, which is our own currency, which is not which is not yet on the blockchain. So the idea was come on to Goki, do healthy behavior, and get rewarded in Goki Cash to to really keep doing these behaviors. And this Goki Cash was then connected to our marketplace, where we had partnered with health food companies, supplement companies, uh, all kinds of uh, healthy products, t-shirts, shoes. So what happened is you could earn this currency and then use this currency to get discounts or even massive deals on products which you would want to do. So even before the advent of Web3, we built this entire ecosystem which guides, motivates, and rewards people to become healthier and smarter. And that is when uh, I think the inflection point, which is around Web3 is coming in, which is why uh, I am personally very excited. So Goki is, uh, the way I, I define it, it is the health ecosystem. And now this ecosystem is going to transition to a health metaverse. Fantastic. I mean, wow. I feel like I, I have no other better metaphor. I wish I had a healthier metaphor, a kid in a candy shop to unpack a lot of the things. I mean, where do I even begin? The fact that India's, India's rise as a both a consumer nation and as a uh, entrepreneurial uh, force of nature, uh, your hero's journey, uh, you know, scratching your own itch, your gamification and entrepreneurial background, it's all leading up. You know, I think about when I turned 40 and um, I think your um, uh, compatriot, uh, I think it was Gandhi said, nothing uh, tastes as good as skinny feels. Um, and you know, that's, that's terrific if you're actually already skinny, but I think there's also another quote, which is uh, nothing. And I mean, nothing is as easy and as fun as gaining weight in so, in so many ways, it's really tough. So I turned 40 and I, um, Bought, uh, the four hour body. Uh, Tim Ferriss from the four hour work week uh, wrote that. And the reason I, I wanted to listen to Kim because I felt, okay, this is a, a younger person who's not really a, you know, a medical professional, but is somebody that I can relate to and who's done a lot of research and who's, you know, uh, kind of a human guinea pig in a way. So in some ways you've really become like, you're already an iconic guy 
in India, but you're able to really lead this charge and get people excited. I mean, that kind of impact, that kind of kung fu ball of power and have that impact across subcontinent and planet Earth is, is fantastic. Let's let's dive a little bit deeper into there. But before we do, you talked about incentives and where, where does where where does that money come from? Like, what's the what's the actual model and flow of cash, the sinks and the faucets, if you will, of that economy? So currently, before we go to Web three, so I'm still in Web two. Let's put it that way. So in the Web two universe, Goki Cash was essentially funded by our marketing dollars or the margins we get from our partners. So let us say, uh, you know, India's best peanut butter manufacturer works with us and gives us 30% margin. So we are literally giving that 30% margin back to our users because our goal is to convert their health data and their health habit to instant gratification. So the problem is that as you know, most people are seeking instant gratification. They don't want to wait for one in five years to see the real impact of good health. So from a gaming perspective, we had to create loops which give them the instant gratification that I walk 10,000 steps, what now? And this is what games have already been doing for years and years. So the best part was, my team entirely consists of game designers, game programmers. And the funny part is that I don't have a single doctor in my team and we are going to be the world's biggest healthcare company because we are not, because we are not trying to solve a problem which a doctor has to solve. Doctor, it's like saying that I'm trying to make people drive their cars better. I'm not a car mechanic where you go when your car crashes. So I think that's been the challenge of healthcare, that people are driving their bodies to crash because they don't know. The other big problem is, uh, as you know that, you know, platforms like Facebook, Netflix, Instagram, these platforms are extremely addictive and not just addictive, they are also influencing and changing people's behavior. But the problem is, because their incentive is not aligned. You know, Facebook makes money from advertising. Uh, Netflix is making money from selling subscriptions. So the problem is that for them, they are not looking at, hey, can I make this person, uh, if, uh, if their algorithm already knows that you are depressed, which they already know, they have already said that, but they are then showing you, hey, look at how much fun your friend is having in Bali versus trying to tell you that, hey, look at this, yeah, if, if, you're, if you're not depressed after you use it, then you become depressed exactly. anyways. So I think part of the problem is, and which is why I love Web3, is because in Web3, your consumer is your stakeholder. And your product and your service is designed to do what is the best for the consumer, not just what is best for your advertiser. So the conflict of interest of business models while an, a, a Facebook will always try to serve you an ad which you will click or modify your behavior so that you are clicking into more ads because that is what their incentive is. Our incentive is actually the opposite. Our incentive is how can I make Rich, uh, Yat and everybody else a healthier version of themselves so that they continue to be on our platform. So the minute incentives are aligned, the behavior of the companies or organizations also massively shift. Fantastic. And you're, you're capturing a lot of data, which of course, you know, anonymized across um, a broad spectrum of users is super valuable for insurance companies and other stakeholders. Is, is there a future where these insurance companies and large corporations are also paying and incentivize users to, to be healthier because it's very much in their interest? So, and, and that's the beauty of it, right? So in the gaming world, as you know, we always had a way to get extra lights. We always had God mode so that your character never dies. So we literally took that concept and applied it to Goki. And we said, hey, Goki is the game of life. So the way to win the game of life is that you live longer and healthier. 
and the insurance plan gives you the protection so you can get additional of course i can't give you multiple life but but i can give you a shield so the way insurance works in the goki system is the insurance company is saying because your level in the game is high so there are four levels we call it sedentary active fit and elite so within goki these are the different levels you can achieve as you become healthier and for being in a different level the insurance company will reward you with a higher insurance cover so effectively the insurance company does not even want your data all they want to know is what is your level and that level determines your risk and your corresponding insurance coverage fantastic yeah so i turned 55 recently and i got uh during covid i got um, life insurance for the first time in my life and there are plans out there you know i take my health very seriously and i have a very uh attractive plan because they they look at the data they look at my you know they i did a full physical and they went really deep and they said okay here here you go you're you know um insurance is something that you want to never have to use right and you want to be able to be on the on the on the right side of the actuarial tables so yeah so all those incentives really matter and that kind of but, yeah please 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 so on the on the actuarial tables what you just said is the problem with actuarial tables is that they underwrite you at the time of giving you the policy what we are telling the insurance company is that you, okay you have given richard an insurance plan and a premium now on a daily basis if richard is putting more effort his premium should be lower because they are assuming if they are assuming your age as one they assume that you are going to decay over a period of time so automatically Indeed. automatically your premiums will set to in- increase every year mm-hmm. but what we are saying is that no if we can give you data to show that richard is working out and doing you know meditating and eating healthier he is his actuarial data should not change so we are giving insurance companies the equivalent of what you know uh, what let's say the wealth managers or you know you can look at your portfolio on a daily basis and see whether your financial portfolio is up or down but you don't do that with health we want to do that with health of what we call dynamic re- underwriting fascinating wow that's a much much bigger game that you're playing and that is absolutely uh like writ large there is a collective sort of score of your users that is you know you can continue with uh you know this sort of bio um you know hacking this uh ability to track sleep and you know and and not just exercise diet and meditation and even you know mood and mental health and all of those things and just keep nudging them in the right direction that with web3 and metaverse what our big idea is that basically your digital twin your avatar should have all your health data and your insurance company is effectively looking at the avatar and doing underwriting so your underwriting actually is happening on the metaverse so that is exactly what we are building in so what we are saying is if your avatar is your true digital twin currently they say that the person just need to look like you or you know have features like you and your name etc but why can't it have your underlying biometric information or some kind of a score and that is the bridge we are building so the traditional metaverse is like a fantasy world where you may be there but it has got nothing to do in the real world what our vision is the way to connect your real real world and your metaverse virtual world with health being the key uh, data connector to it and that is why uh, whether it is healthcare companies insurance companies government everybody is very keen because they know that if they are not able to do this we just need another pandemic to hit and that could create a devastating blow to countries as well as insurance companies who are actually paying for healthcare wonderful i love the uh mission and vision of do well but also uh do good and i think in this web3 space uh gaming of course it's the tip of the spear um at anamoka's 
you know, Focus 3.4 billion gamers, 200 billion in revs, and, you know, it's a, an existing pool of users and revenue. But to take that gamification, to take that sensibility and experience that you have from previous ventures and to bring that to this industry, I think, in I believe that most industries will be gamified and tokenized ultimately to be able to incentivize and reward users. Yeah. I mean, the way I think about it is that currently we are in the slave generation of the internet. This is what was happening when, you know, monarchs and dictators. Exactly. So today, so today, you know, there are four or five large companies, Facebook, Google, Amazon, and we are all slaves to them. We are given free, they're saying we're giving you free access to the app. So it's like saying we're giving you free food and water. Now plow my fields, you know, work for me for free. So we are all providing them data, information for free, but our data and information is used to enrich their algorithms. Uh, create targeting, create all kinds of business models on top of my data and your data. And in return, we get nothing. We are just getting the product for free. So it is the equivalent of a slave who is plowing the fields, creating, mining the, the places, removing the gold. But when the gold is removed, the only thing I get is free food and water. And that is the problem of the current internet business model. Similarly, I have no recourse. Anybody can block my account, ban my account, do whatever they want. I can't do anything. So that is what is happening today on the internet. We as users don't have any rights. Our data is not protected. But in, in the Web3 universe, what I am really thinking and the way I'm envisaging is the open metaverse changes this where I have access to my data. I own my data. Any company wants to use my data, of course, can give me a token or in return of value, I can give data. That data can be used for insurance underwriting, medical research, any kind of processing. And as the platform grows, I automatically get benefited because I own the token to the platform. So the minute you are able to incentivize for the right use case, Currently, a lot of Web3 use cases are vaporware, as you know, because there is no underlying asset around it. But the minute you connect Web3 to real applications like health, education, food, so I think, uh, and, and I know Animoca is working on a number of different, uh, you know, there is EdTech and there is verticals, environment, climate. So the best part is that what we are just seeing on Web3 is the tip of the iceberg. The minute these concepts start working on various industries, it's going to completely disrupt the market. Certainly, and users not only become used to it, but they, they demand it and they, you know, where's, where's the incentive for me? And in, in some ways, I, you opened up an idea in my head that in, you know, Web2 is helping to build some, some bad habits for people and, uh, you know, of course, Web3, there will be some bad habits there too, but you can really use it for good to, you know, somebody once told me, if you look at life broadly, you're either shining light or casting shadows. So you, you, you want to you shine light. And um, I teach a course at an MBA program and I tell my younger students, uh, you know, if you can swap out some bad habits for good habits and just do, you know, one or two or three of those over a year, then that's a compounding effect that can have such a positive ripple effect that I kind of wish I knew earlier. And I think your uh, experience as, a, as an entrepreneur, it was just a, you know, a lot of small decisions, you know, going from a national athlete to being 120 kilos. I mean, you know, those are, that would have been terrific had you had these um, opportunities and incentives to, to do things differently. Can, can, can we go a little bit into your uh, uh, hero's journey of India Games, you know, that's when I got to know you in the early 2000s, building uh, India's first and biggest mobile game company, and that path to now, please. So I just think, Rich, that I've been lucky that I've been able to always pursue my hobbies into my business, so, which is why I never felt that I've been working a single day in my life. I'm, I'm always having fun. It was 
in the early 1990s i was a 16 year old kid uh, programming computer games on my zx spectrum uh, one of the early computers and then uh, of course uh, i was i was creating games on all the early uh, you know whether it is ms dos and you know i've been on every generation of computers and the best thing for me was even during that time i was doing something which people told me it's a stupid idea so for example today when we everybody is like i mean metaverse is useless zuckerberg is you know you know the whole thing is bad and it's stupid and i actually gain a lot of confidence and strength when people tell me what i'm doing is stupid so so today and you we are we are all companions in that same journey where every second day or every day literally people tell us that hey metaverse is all bullshit and it's not going to work and I, i tell people that hey this is exactly what i was hearing in the early days of gaming when people said who's ever going to spend time playing a game on a mobile phone who's ever going to play pay money to play games these are things which people never believe today you know gaming is the biggest entertainment industry in the world it makes more money than movies uh, mobile phones primary use case out, out, outside talking and social networking is gaming so gaming is something which is very core to people's behavior because we are all social animals uh, you know we are all at the day monkeys evolved into something and so we all love to play and with 5g coming in with your phones becoming more smarter foldable and you know collapsible better screens better display we are all going to be using apps like games and that is why i really buy into this whole idea of the metaverse but but shifting back to india games when i started the company people said it is not going to work and that was the exciting part uh you know i raised money in 1999 when nobody knew what venture capital was 1999 was my first ever funding round i am of course i was of course a college dropout and i did not even know what funding meant uh you know it is literally those times uh to building india games and once again what i learned was that running a startup is possibly the most difficult thing in the world people only read headlines that this company is this many billions and all of that right people only look at the headlines but they don't understand that a life of an entrepreneur is basically getting struck by lightning every day in the morning when you wake up but you have to continue the day just like it's a normal day and i think that's the beauty for me in fact in my case i say i love chaos the day i don't find chaos i'm worried that what has gone wrong that there is nothing is going going wrong so i think that is the state so india games was a great journey we built the company we got multiple investors you know from china we got investors from hong kong singapore malaysia uh, south uh, silicon valley europe finally we sold the company to disney that was quite a journey i was with disney I think uh, we started 1999 we sold to Disney 2012 so it is almost a 12 13 year old journey uh, and I think the the journey was really the exciting in part because we saw the entire transition of the gaming industry it was previously dominated by telecom operators there was a time when they were the gateways to the consumer and then we saw a time when Nokia had 70% market share then we saw the time when apple came in the rest is history the whole market changed from mobile operator to telecom operator to uh, app store and now and, and and along the way you probably started doing text games and then you were doing wap and brew and java and then exactly exactly every technology every technology and there was a time we had almost 300 different handsets in our office so a game you know making a game was not just making one game you had to make games for different screen orientation mm-hmm. when testing it across 300 handsets so it was a logistical challenge to even deploy a game into the market because you were literally creating a brew game a java game a j to any game japan had its own i mode system print telecom and then you need a, a different a different version of the game for different operators even and so sometimes you would have like hundreds of different versions of of one game exactly and then different languages and then when we were deploying in china maybe even thousands yeah yeah 
and then in China it had its own complication. So I think it was a very interesting time because you got to learn a lot. And I think when we exited to Disney, that was again kind of uh, end of that era of gaming. And I was then given a non-compete. So the best thing actually which happened to me is the non-compete because it forced me to not think of gaming, but think of what can I do with my gaming knowledge in another industry. So I think, you know, in a way, I want to thank Disney. <laughs> so, so Forcing function. Interesting. Yeah. Well, 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 first of all, let, let's tell everybody out there, I know you're a, a modest guy, but that was about, you know, about a hundred million dollar deal. So that was uh, quite extraordinary at the time. And especially for India. I mean, India has really flourished as an entrepreneurial ecosystem. But back then it was mostly kind of a lot of BPO, business process outsourcing. And there weren't a lot of like, you know, indigenous entrepreneurs in the space. And uh, so you're really an, an uh, well, I think that was clearly, we were lucky. That was one of the early exits, you know, nobody had seen exits in India. Uh, and that to a cash exit, you know, they were, you know, m as and stuff like that happened. But Disney was a great exit for our investors. Some of our investors made 16x, 20x, 30x returns. So I think it was a great story because, you know, at the end of the day, people who are betting on startups need to see an exit, which is why exits are very important for the ecosystem. So I think for us, uh, you know, it was important for all our other stakeholders, our employees, team members, and I think it was a good exit for all of us. Uh, also, I then realized I was for, for a year in Disney, I learned the difference between an entrepreneurial setup and a corporate setup. And of course, of course, Disney is a great company. I have no, no complaints around it. But then I realized that an executive is, is very good at, at managing what is currently there. But as an entrepreneur, you are always building something from nothing. And I think that is what I personally enjoy. And I think that's where really I... Yeah, I mean, that's, that's such a, a common story of people doing their glorious exit, having a lockup, and then, and then hearing the hum of the Muzak in the elevator. And it just is such a juxtaposition of your previous life. Like what, what were some of the things that you did to kind of get through that or any any lessons learned for founders that are going to do future exits, how to best manage that? So I think, you know, it's very important to see the DNA of the company you are working with. So I think luckily for, for us, Disney is known to be a fair company. You know, they, they have, you know, respect for employees. And so I think a lot of times, uh, you know, just it, this is uh, an m and is just like getting into a relationship. And, you know, if you are getting into a relationship who's not compatible, it can really go bad very fast. So with Disney, I did not, I, personally, I had an issue because I was entrepreneurial, but my most of my other team members love Disney as a place. Disney also is a great home for IP because that's how Disney was built. You know, so they knew how to take intellectual property. So, so from a from a matching perspective, it was a great outcome for all of us. Uh, and even Disney was happy. So, I think a great M and A is when all parties are happy with the outcome. And I think India Games was able to give them a very good return on. Certainly, as far as far as a, a nice a nice you know landing, that's a, that's a great place to land indeed. Exactly. It was a great place to land. I think the other thing which is very important from an m and perspective is to understand what are the way success is measured in organizations. So one thing which was a sh kind of a shock to me is in a startup world, we will say next year's target is 300% from this year. And then we target 300%, we end up at 200% or whatever, 210%. And everybody is cheerful. Great, we, we achieved 210%. But in Disney or in large company, if you are saying your target is 300%, then you have to meet 300%. You can't say you are less or more. I think they all reward predictability because if you are part of a larger, larger organization. So in a, in a startup, what you are rewarding is aggression and scale and growth while a larger company is looking not at growth, they are looking at predictability. So there, what I learned was for a larger company, if you commit to 10%, you achieve 10%. There's a problem if you achieve 11 <laughs> because you could not predict correctly or even nine. 
So that is a big challenge which entrepreneurs. You just you you have to stick, you have to stick the landing. Yeah, interesting. So and 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 that is how you run a large ship, right? Because if you are Disney and if every manager is giving you random projections which can go up and down, you can't run a multi-billion-dollar company. So. the thought process is very different which is why taking risk is a challenge for them because risk changes the predictability of their business which is why companies like disney will always look to startups to acquire invest because they cannot do this in their own system outsource that risk they cannot do this in their own systems the second thing which is also very important is you need to realize early on that who are your allies so in gaming our whole idea was that we are going to build ip based games so anybody who had ips was our ally in goki for example we have realized that our allies are going to be people who want health data which is insurance companies and government our allies are pharmaceutical companies and healthcare companies who want to use data to improve outcomes so they are our allies and our other allies are companies who are incentivized to create health products services supplements so they are our allies so we have a much wider group of allies and these allies could be potential investors acquirers strategic partners so it is very important to to create that landscape and the second thing is you know one of the biggest questions i get asked is who's your competition and i keep telling that my competition is not any other app or device or any other health health product or service my competition is actually what is stopping you from being healthy that is the way we look at competition so so our competition is netflix who does not want you to sleep they want you to binge watch excellent uh, the whole night mm. and, and netflix you the candy rack at the checkout counter in yeah. the supermarkets yes exactly right. exactly yeah. exactly mm. similarly our competition are apps food apps uh, you know like doordash or zomato who are offering you discounts to order pizzas and burgers and fries and stuff so we are trying hard to make our user healthier by changing healthy behaviors and habits and then there are other apps and services in the world which are making you lazy and giving you junk food and making sure you don't sleep so the way we look at our competition is in fact all people who are trying to make people healthy are our allies that's the way we look at this business mm. terrific and i think this is and and this is one mistake a lot of people make that they get too obsessed with other companies in the space and look at each other as competition while the reality is all of us need to work together because we are trying to beat the bigger devil here which is companies which are making you unhealthy in the first place yeah and in fact most companies certainly die because of suicide rather than murder they are their own worst enemies and there are so many ways to to partner and um yeah if i look at the three exits that i have they were all companies that i partnered with who then ended up acquiring us later right there's a you know you have to look at the ecosystem but i think let's go back to like your kind of mindset you know you said that you haven't ever worked a day in your life because you love what you do but i think also you're kind of an extraordinary guy in that you have this um very strong energy about you this optimism this curiosity this um outgoing behavior high eq high iq and i think that's something that you've really um weaponized in a way to be an entrepreneur like you're using every asset that you have to be able to give you some sort of unfair advantage to be able to you know rise above the noise and can you share with us some of those you're covered in scabs and calluses and scar tissue like armor over the last uh, couple of decades and what have you um what have you taken from uh that india games experience and brought it to goki so i think it is not just about india games experience i think you know i i always credit my first real learning from my day in sports i was a national volleyball player i used to play as a team sport 
and and i think when you play play as a team sport and that's why i encourage all entrepreneurs managers to take up a sport because sport is what teaches you to fail in school and college you are always trying to score high and win right you are not you are, you don't learn how to fail but what happens in 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 sports is normally you will lose 9 out of 10 matches you know and then next day you have to go and motivate your team again and go back to the to the ground to play a match you will deal with different people with different temperaments and some day some team member won't turn up because they had another thing and so what i what i learned early on was that you need a team to win you can't be a one man team for anything and i think that is what i learned very early on even from my career in sports that a you need to learn to fail i think most people who come from corporate life because in corporate life you don't learn to fail because you are it's kind of like school right you're you're on rails and you don't you want to get a good grade every time and you're not taking as much risk and and failure and 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 failure is shameful if you fail in school it's a shame if you fail in office uh, you know if you're it's a shame but in sport failing and and it's a shame that it's a shame because in sports it's all completely public and open and there's everybody expects it it expects this and it's sports and spirit that you know you call it the you know you you fail today but next year you're going to be back into this tournament and you're going to beat the hell out of the competition and you are the underdog so so that is where i actually started learning this and i think that is the attitude of a startup you are playing a sport and you have a team you are the avenger terrific of of this and you are all trying to fight a common enemy so a vision is very very important you know everybody needs to be aligning to a purpose coming together and that purpose is doing and achieving something and knowing fully well that you will keep failing at it but you still go at it because the larger purpose is motivating you and i think in goki we found that purpose we said we have figured out a way to change the world of health and make everybody healthier and happier and uh, in fact we are so obsessed with it we have created longevity as our metric we say we are going to make you live longer so our our promise is we will actually change uh, if if goki as the way it is implemented it can make everybody live over 100 years but healthy and not you know uh, during their end connected to lifespan. tubes lifespan and health span so so that is where we 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 created that purpose and now the team is all charged to work it and failure is actually part of our dna in fact if we don't fail we will not achieve which is why we take up very very audacious you know big tasks you know where we we say we are going to like when we said we are building the health metaverse we are going to have our token you know we are partnering with animoca brands because of that big vision and ambition which we have which is normally missing people when they dream they dream very small i think in startups your dream needs to be very very big you may be a company of just two people but your dream should be really big fantastic wow i think back to my basketball coach who said uh robinson you need to get more fouls you need to get three four fouls every game you're not trying hard enough so you should be having some stumbles and failures along the way because you're not taking enough risks you're not kind of like maybe moving moving fast enough what a terrific metaphor you know mark cuban um from shark tank has a book about entrepreneurship is the ultimate sport and i think ray dalio from principles talks about how he thinks of his company uh, bridgewater you know biggest hedge fund in the world as a team not not as a family it's more like sports team and people have their specific roles and you know some people don't you know not everybody is a is a center uh some people are guards some people are you know shooting uh forwards and um it's important to know what your role is and to be able to work well within that so yeah and fantastic metaphor for of course for what you're working on on now because of the uh the 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 sports sports relation i uh i love that um i think you know i also heard a, a podcast recently from Scott Galloway 
Prof G as he's known. And he said, um, uh, how, how have I been successful with my startups? I hire uh, women who have been to amazing universities who play college sports. Uh, and then after the age of 30, I hire men because men take a little bit longer to uh, to mature. But women athletes from top schools are, will just chew through barbed wire. And uh, I think there's a there's a really good correlation between all of that eating bitter, as they say in Chinese, chur cool. Like how, how much like uh, you were you're a national national team. Yeah. So I was in the national volleyball team. And I mean, that kind of commitment there. And, and you're also a college dropout, which is actually a pretty excellent uh, indicator for entrepreneurial success. But back then, I think nobody, nobody really did that. That was, especially in your uh, very strong, educationally focused Indian culture, that must have been a scandal, especially for a smart guy like you. Yeah, I mean, it was it was less of a scandal because I'd already raised a couple of million dollars when I was still in college. So I think. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that makes it all right then. Yeah, okay. Not the other way around. You know, I'm already running a company. I'm hiring people from IIT and IIM in my company. I don't need to go there. So I think, uh, you know, my, my parents were really supportive. I think, you know. Dad, Dad, I'm dropping out of school. Mom, I'm dropping out of school. That's terrible. I raised a million dollars. Enjoy your new company. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, like I said, right, you know, sometimes it is, you're just lucky to be surrounded by people who have always been supportive. And I think in my case, that is what ended up happening, whether it is my parents, uh, you know, my early investors were my cheerleaders. So, you know, that is really, you know, even now, you know, when we meet Yat and you and everybody at Animoca, you are not investors in the traditional sense. You are cheerleaders. You are, you know, you are like the, the manager who is funding this team and you're rooting for their success, not only from the sidelines, but in the arena, because you are also a company yourself. Uh, it is much different than a fund who is just looking at everything from the lens of an Excel sheet. I think there is a lot beyond the Excel sheet which I think is where the real value of a company is. Yes. And I think. Yes. Well, keep, keep, keep going with that because I think, I think in that sports metaphor, if you're showing up to a stadium to watch a game, people aren't like, yeah, I don't know. You gotta be, I'm not so sure they're going to win today. You know, there's really tough competition. Like everybody just be, be quiet, you know, be a little bit more reserved. No, you have to be like, yes, you can do it. Let's go. Rah, rah, rah. Inspire. And in sport, you know, whatever game you played, if you saw a friend in the in the audience, you saw your parent, your teacher, in the audience who had come to cheer you, that itself was enough it to boost you, right? It helps. It really works. And 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 why why wouldn't that work? Somehow in a in a corporate environment, we're like, oh, we must be professional and use professional uh, terms when we speak and dress professionally and be a little bit more professional and reserved. It's like. No, that kind of energy, because as you as you said before, it seems sexy from the outside to be an entrepreneur, but the reality of it is, you know, Elon Musk says it's like chewing glass while looking into the abyss. It's really important vocation and endeavor, but sure is tough. So you need all the help you can get. And, and it is even tough when we are doing what is going to be the biggest technology breakthrough in the world with Web3. I think... You know, you need to obsessively believe in what you do. I think uh, that the the interesting part of what Animoca and what the team, uh, you know, at Animoca and all of us are doing is we are not only doing a startup, we are actually paving the way for the new revolution in technology because uh, I think currently we are all, uh, we are all sick of what is happening in the world of, you know, social media. You know, there was so much, you know, accounts are getting banned and, you know, uh, inf you know, inf fake news is everywhere. Uh, so there is a whole challenge. I think technology, which was supposed to solve a lot of problems, is actually creating a lot of problems right now, uh, you know, with what we are seeing. So I think we are not only creating a startup, which is difficult already, but we are actually paving the way for the future of the Internet itself and society. Indeed, and you're you're an excellent evangelist. Um, I see you with your team. I see you, you know, I brought your name up to somebody 
who I randomly met today and an Indian guy who has moved here to Bali. And he's like, Oh yeah, sure. I, I know, I know who Vishal is. I know who Goki is. That's a, that's amazing. And you know, Yat of course is an amazing evangelist for uh, web three and the promise that it, that it can hold. And I think there's a, a much bigger picture that you talk about, even though India is such an exciting place right now for web three. Can, can you, can you share a little bit about, give us a little snapshot of your, amazing home country. As I understand it, I believe one of the biggest stories, not just in Asia, but globally, is what's happened with data in India and how that's transformed the, the continent. So a very interesting piece of information, which is not very well known, is India is actually one of the biggest contributors of DAUs to Facebook, Google. Every platform has millions and millions and billions of users from India. The revenue contribution may still be coming from the West, but the user contribution is from India. When Facebook bought WhatsApp for 17 billion, 90% or 80% of WhatsApp users were largely from India. So the best part is India is already known to be using a very early adopter of technology a very, very uh, demanding market because our consumers are using the best products in the world. They are using Uber, WhatsApp, Amazon, you know. So, so if you have to break into India, you are already dealing with the consumer who is very, very savvy. They, their product expectation is Magic. very, very, very high because they are experiencing the best products in the world already. So. So when you compete in India, it's an open market, unlike China and other places where there are restrictions. In India, pretty much every app is live here. So what happens is that when companies think about India, they just think about the population, but they are forgetting that Indian users and their behavior is driving actually how apps are built and consumed worldwide. The second unique thing about India is the high penetration of smartphones. I think we now have six, 700 million smartphones. I think soon there'll be like a billion smartphones and not just smartphones, our adoption of technology. We have something called UPI, uh, which was built over the last five years. That's our own payment system. And it is processing billions of payment transactions. Today, uh, I would say that bulk of transactions are happening uh, digitally, all the money wire transactions. So what has happened is, and pretty much this is penetrated right to the smallest village in the country. So we have already adopted digital payments in a massive way. We have adopted uh, digital governance in a very big way. I think our government is very, very pro-technology and almost every aspect of the government is now digitized and available on an app. Yeah, it, it's actually much farther ahead than, than the West in so many ways. So in fact, during COVID, we were issued digital QR coded vaccination certificates. We were possibly the only country, even in the US, they are giving you chits written with your, all our vaccines were digitized. Uh, they were all verifiable. There are apps, you can get any certificate. So what happened is India, which was traditionally making software for the world, uh, you know, we were like the, the back office to the world for software today is using that same that same knowledge and creating world class products for India itself. The second thing is in the geopolitical scene, as you know, with Russia and Ukraine and China, what has happened is India is possibly the only uh, only a region where we have stability, we have growth. GDP growth and all this is real. So what is happening is we are seeing billions of dollars coming to India in terms of investments, in terms of, and I think similarly with Southeast Asia is also getting a lot of benefit from this, you know, Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, again, right? So what has happened is this entire region of India and Southeast Asia is getting the benefit of the destabilization of the rest of the world. Uh, with whatever is happening. So I think it's a great market. And finally, uh, the best thing about India is that uh, Indian, Indian consumers are of three kinds. I give an example. I say India is like Australia 
Mexico and Sub-Saharan Africa into one. So there are consumers who can afford the most expensive phone and the most expensive TV and spend thousands of dollars. There are about 100 to 200 million people who can do that. Then there is the Mexico, there is the large middle class, and then there is the Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the people who are still not that affluent. So your product or service, Depending on who you are targeting, you could be selling the most expensive Gucci bag to uh, Unilever who is selling shampoos in one rupee sachets. You can just buy, in India it's possibly the only place where you could go and buy a one-time use shampoo versus America where you will buy this giant container where you can use shampoo for the rest of your life we're using that one container so in india was the first place where because people could not afford but they still wanted to use the product so they were the sachet model which we talked about so so for companies to think about india as one itself is wrong india is a, a multi it's, it's like a is like a metaverse in itself mm. certainly not a monolith and i i you know i spent a lot of time there starting in 08 and it's interesting because my mindset around India, you talked about this sachet with shampoo. In a lot of ways, data was like that. I saw people buying data, maybe sometimes just for a couple of hours, people buying tiny packets of, of data. But something, there was a gigantic step change in the last few years. Can you tell our listeners about that? Like I was, I was literally shocked uh, about how dramatic it has been with data in India. And, and that happened because of one company called Geo, Reliance Geo. So Reliance basically came and said, I'm going to make data as water. Everybody should get data unlimited. So literally, India is today the country which consumes the highest amount of mobile data because our data plans are extremely affordable. So from, so just to give you a context, there was a time when you paid for 2 GB data, you would pay about $5 a month to access 2 GB. Today, you pay $5 a month and you get 2 GB a day. Wow. So you get wow. six. So an, average, so an average person would be using 30 to 40 GB or 1 GB plan. So minimum is a 1 GB a day kind of a plan. So our data, because data was restricted, people were not streaming videos. People were not playing multiplayer games because it was metered. What they did is they just kind of opened the floodgates and because of that, YouTube usage, OTT usage, Netflix usage, gaming usage, everything went through the roof. And that is because of, you know, not giving restriction on data and opening the pipes as we say. Mm, fantastic. And I know that there are plenty of wealthy people there, but still, you know, ARPU on average, is, is still low, but all that time I spent in China, what I saw was that China was able to really scale things in a massive way. And uh, I think India, what you're doing in India right now, your ability to really scale what you have and the ARPU will come. Of course, things are moving up and to the right. There's gonna be a rising middle class and the ARPU will, will continue to grow. But I think we're gonna see more and more companies like your, your good self come out of India and then take that kind of Kung Fu ball of power and take it to the rest of the world. It's already very robust um, and, and hugely scaled. I got so excited about what's happening in India, but your ability to kind of take that Kung Fu ball of power, push it out to the rest of the world with higher ARPU markets is, I think, going to be really exciting story like india itself is going to be an epicenter for web3 but it's also going to become a much bigger global player i think i think one other another very exciting thing has happened for india as you know that all major ceos of tech companies are now somehow they have, are oh, indians oh that it's a indian mafia around the world it's extraordinary to see indian mafia around the world so that has been a very good you know there's been a way that's kind of projected a great image of india right i think it is yes. you know it is less about the people i think people associate india as indians as people who understand technology who understand product development I think that is really the best thing. And today, a company like Polygon, which again is doing such amazing work, 
we all know it has come from India and Polygon is like powering a lot of the three uh, businesses and data around it and what Polygon has done. We, we do a lot of stuff with Polygon. We're very bullish on their team and their vision. And yeah. And, 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 and you won't believe that the amount of Web3 startups which are coming up in India is, is crazy. I mean, I would say that I would be surprised that over the next 12 to 18 months, there will be hundreds, I'm not talking of like tens, but hundreds of Web3 startups coming up because everybody, whoever wants to think of where the puck will go, will have to look at Web3 because you can only do that much incremental work over what is already there. So I think Web3 changes the game. And I have personally now seen so many companies, projects, which are all getting built uh, here in India. And uh, I'm, I'm personally very excited about the future of Web3 and the future of how uh, Indian technology would do. And I think they working with somebody like Animoca who can then, you know, kind of take them to another orbit. So I think uh, Animoca's role is really to pay, play the role of the global accelerator of taking all these ships to orbit as soon as possible. Love it. Yeah. And if you're a builder um, out there in India, please, uh, please reach out to us. Vishal, wow. Always, always a pleasure. I'm excited about what the future is going to bring for you and, and Goki. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Can't wait to visit India Thank and you see, you, see you in person once again. Thanks for, for having me on the podcast and really looking forward to building more and more things with you and Animoka together. Thank you. This podcast is for information purposes only and should not be considered as financial advice. Any opinions provided in this podcast reflect the views of the speakers only.